Hi everyone, welcome to RPI Data Science. So last time uh, we were talking about uh, tuning support vector machines and in fact we have already tuned radial SVM and linear SVM and we have already used uh, uh, different uh, hyperparameters and we have tuned our algorithms, two of our algorithms and we have already used that algorithm for prediction and we have seen uh, excellent performances actually from two of our algorithms. Uh, in fact, we, we have done two each we're using the simple frequency data, uh, simply using the train document feature matrix or the TFID version of um, our um, core data. And we have already seen um, uh, some good performances and we have seen uh, we have created a function if you remember so we have created a function to um, to um, extract the confidence intervals from not not confidence intervals actually the confusion matrix uh, all the contingency tables and all the details uh, like sensitivity specificity and stuff like that so if you haven't already watched that i recommend watching it so it's on part 17 support vector machines uh, tuning support vector machines for biomedical text classification uh, so then uh, because we will continue from here uh, then this will be uh, this will this video the current one will be much easier <coughs> uh, so uh, if you remember um, so let me scroll up to what we did in um, um, radial SVM. So because we will, we are going to use uh, this one again. Uh, so what we did is like, uh, so we uh, call it SVM tuned uh, radial SVM, and then uh, we move to. Uh, we, the first uh, the first argument that you give for tune uh, function is SVM, uh, and you have to always make sure that you don't have any object named SVM, otherwise you will have a problem. So you always have to uh, you make sure that you don't you don't call your object uh, SVM. Otherwise, uh, if you are tuning, uh, that, that, that's what I said. This is what I'm, I'm trying to explain. So you don't have to call your uh, object SVM. Otherwise, uh, if you if you are planning to tune SVM function, I mean uh, SVM algorithms, then uh, you will have a problem. So you always have to uh, make sure that you don't have an object named SVM. Uh, the same is actually for other other algorithms like naive bias, for example. If you put naive bias here, then uh, you make sure that you don't have an object. It's, it's the same principle, like you don't need to have an, an object named data or something. That it's not because they, there will be some conflict. Um, then, uh, if you remember, we, uh, the way we define our kernel is here. This is our, the key difference. And then we define the type because we are planning our goal is classification. And then uh, we do parallelizing. And then here is how we define the uh, parameters. So we have given the cost and the gamma parameters. Uh, we need this uh, for radial and other, uh, actually for all kernel strategies except for linear. So we don't need gamma parameters for linear, uh, but otherwise uh, we need all everything else. And the last one is about you know validation, cross validation, because we we were planning, we uh, wanted to do temporal cross validation. So nothing will be different. We just need to change this into uh, sigmoid because today I, uh, we are going to tune sigmoid uh, kernel. Um, I mean sigmoid to <coughs> support vector machine with sigmoid kernel. So we will change this one. Otherwise, the data frame, um, the data, and everything else will be will be the same, and we will change uh, the objects to um, yeah to to um, sigmoid. So let me copy this and I will, uh, I will post it somewhere. So if you remember, this has taken 10 minutes to complete and this was 12 minutes. And then uh, um, linear SVM, because it doesn't have uh, multiple parameters, uh, like it doesn't take gamma. So that's why it was a little relatively faster. So it took only 44 seconds and then uh, 1.2 minutes to complete. In fact, this machine is a four, a four core, um, uh, a four core machine with uh, uh, more than 20, 20, actually 24 GB RAM machine. So it might be a little bit uh, <laughs> better than uh, the, the machine you have. I mean, I don't know, you may have a more powerful machine, but this uh, is that's a 24 GB. Machine. So that's why um, it was able to parallelize and to finish all the calculations as quickly as we wanted. <coughs> Um, yeah, and then uh, so I already copied it. So the, what I need is I have to paste it somewhere here and then change a few things. So this is what I need is I first have to change this to sigmoid and then uh, again I will call this one again change it to sigmoid, sigmoid, and then the same is true. I will also need to do change this to sigmoid, sigmoid, and then also call change the kernel parameter. Otherwise everything will will stay the same and I will. Um, I will define my start time, of course. Uh, so I want to measure how long um, how long it takes to train these algorithms, and then uh, make sure you always have to set seed. This is important if you want to reproduce your results. Otherwise, every time you run something, the results will, will be different. Um, and if you are writing a paper or something, if you are you know, uh, then your results have to be reproduced. Then you always make sure that you need to set it. I mean, this number can be anything. It's, you just need to use uh, use it every time you you run your your syntax. Yeah, that's uh, all we need, and the rest will, will stay the same. I will simply define sigmoid, and then again here sigmoid, the rest is the same. So I don't have to worry anything about um, Then now I simply need to run it and come back after it's finished. So let me run it here, and then uh, I will be back when it's completed. Let me pause the video, and we'll be back. Awesome. Now it's completed. Um, our algorithm is already trained. Um, so uh, then let's see how long it took to train. So it took only uh, seven minutes uh, for the beginning, and then for the TFID version of the data, it took about nine minutes. So it took a little bit longer than uh, longer than the, uh, the I mean the secret frequency, which is not uh, weighted, <coughs> which the data is not is not weighted according to the number of uh, yeah the terms using TFID metric. Yeah. So uh, let me have a look uh, summary of these models, and then uh, we may need to extract the number of kernels and do other stuff. Um, let me just look at the summary. Summary. 
yeah, so um, uh, here is a tenfold cross validation. So the best performance is somewhere at uh, 0 0.06. This is the error actually. So it's uh, when cost is one and gamma is set to 0 0.02. This is where our um, our best algorithm is. So that's our um, that's the algorithm that we have to use. Otherwise, you know, it's uh, 112 different combinations. You can do uh, more, and uh, but it will it will again take more time. Um, as I said, you can you can add more uh, more parameters. I mean, more numbers to gamma and cost, and see uh, and train your algorithm to to make it better. You can you can make it better. Um, so that's uh, how it is. But let me check the number of support vectors. Maybe it's a it's a good idea to, to make the number of support vectors. And let me simply take it. So this actually it doesn't show the number of support vectors, but uh, there is a way to do that. Uh, actually, I would like to extract the number of support vectors uh, for each you know for each algorithm. So let me do that. Yeah, so to extract the support vectors, the first thing, let me see the names, the names of, let's say, one of our trained algorithms, CSVM, um, CSVM linear, for example, uh, CSVM linear, so let's see um, how it looks like. So these are the, uh, the names that we need to look uh, to look at. Uh, so we have best parameters, best performance method, and then uh, this model, for example, this is, a, this, the, the, this is actually the object that you need to use uh, for your um, for prediction. <clears throat> so the first thing that I need is the, uh, I need to check this variable names and then after that I can compile uh, the support vectors. But how do I uh, get the, support, the number of support vectors? I need to get my uh, best model and then see uh, what is next to, to the best model. So let me check that and if there is any name from it, uh, there are still more names. So this, uh, let me see. So we have the call, the kernel type, the degree, the gamma, and then uh, maybe let me find number of support vectors. Ah yeah, okay, there you go total number of support vectors. This is uh, what it is. So let me get this again. I will add again another dollar sign and then I can find it. Now I can remove the names and then print the number of support vectors. The number of support vectors for the linear is about 328. So if I make it TFIDF, TFIDF, how many support vectors do I have? It's 625. So that means that's why SVM linear, uh, the non-TFIDF version of the data actually performed better than the TFIDF. So the, the larger you get, actually the larger your number of support vectors is, the, uh, the more chance of overfitting. Now, I would like to uh, extract all these number of support vectors in, in a kind of data frame. So to do that, I need to, uh, let's say, um, I don't know, number, um, let me simply call it number support vector, and then let me use our bind, um, then let me simply <coughs> create whatever uh, I need here. So the first thing that let me say is linear SVM, linear, uh, actually, let me call it uh, lin SVM equals, and then SVM linear, and then um, uh, this model, Based model, and then after that again we have to use that TOT total number of support vectors, and then another one we need another one. So for that, what we need is we just copy this one and then um, change things. So let me call this TFIDF, and then um, I change this model into TFIDF because that's uh, actually how we call our model. Next one is radial. So let me call this rad SVM equals uh, SVM tuned. I think that's how I call it. SVM tuned uh, radial. That's my um, radial SVM, and then again based model. Let me have a look, best model again, and then from there, uh, again, we need the total number of support vectors. Then after that, I again need this one again and change things. Um, yes. Just for making it more readable, you can just restructure things. And then TFIDF again, again here, uh, I will just need to change this to TFIDF. And then I go further. Uh, the other one, the last one that I did is sigmoid. So let me just call it sig SVM. Uh, sig SVM equals um, SVM. Sigmoid, SVM sigmoid, this is SVM sigmoid. <coughs> uh, let me make sure that's actually how I call it. So this is SVM 2S. Okay, I shouldn't have. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but this is SVM sigmoid, so I'm, I'm fine. I can simply use uh, SVM sigmoid. And then uh, again, the same, uh, this model, this model. And then from there again, we can use this total number of support vectors. Again, for the next one, I simply copy this and then change things. Okay, let me just copy this and then put it down here. And then from there, TFIDF. Let me call it TFIDF and then I change things. Um, SPM. Yeah, this one here. Then after that, I can um, close this bracket. Um, then actually, I already have a bracket, and maybe I can I can have a look <coughs> how this looks like, and maybe I can convert it to a data frame as data frame as data frame. Uh, and then finally, we can change the names into into something else. So now we have already extracted the number of support vectors. Let me just print it and see how this looks like. So now, and we see linear SVM has 328 support vectors and linear SVM TFIDF 625 and radial SVM is a little bit more than the linear SVM 356 and the radial SVM has 634 and then uh, 388. Maybe I can name this uh, this V1 into um, into something, you know, into some kind of uh, uh, well descriptive name. So to do that, I can simply use the names, the names function, and then assign it to some kind of name. Let's say total uh, okay, number of support vectors. 
I can use it like this. Or maybe a uh, more descriptive support mm. number of support vectors. Just want to be. <coughs> um, yeah. And now if I print this, I will be able to see my. Yeah, so number of support vectors, they are like this. And then um, again, if you remember, we had a function that we created yesterday, I mean, in my last tutorial. So yeah, you remember this is there is this. Uh, first, actually, we need to predict. After that, uh, we can uh, see our confusion matrix and the like. So let me just copy this. And then I can use this spreadconf function. If you remember, we have already created this function uh, just uh, uh, on the path 17 of our tutorial. And this is how we created it. So this function takes a trained model, this trained model, that means a base model, and it takes the test data, uh, test data. And then it, it, uh, so the first thing you need to do is you predict. And then after that, you create, uh, you tabulate uh, your class. That means uh, the predicted class against the, uh, the test. And then uh, from there, you can do, uh, you can get your uh, contingency table or the confusion matrix or this two by two table and then once you get your two by two table or confusion matrix or contingency table you can use this confusion matrix uh, function and then uh, after that you can return the tabulated class and the confusion matrix the tabulated class is this uh, this one uh, actually uh, yeah no uh, the tabulated class is this uh, the first from the list is the first uh, object and then uh, the second one will be actually this is printed twice uh, you may not you may not actually need uh, this tabulated class uh, you just need uh, you can simply return the confusion matrix but instead of running, you know, instead of running all these lines uh, for every algorithm, uh, you can simply uh, use uh, this function and then uh, simplify all the steps for you. That's uh, what actually functional, functional programming helps. It simplifies or it shortens the number of lines of uh, your code. Yeah, so now let me <coughs> use that uh, sigmoid model to predict my uh, test data frame. So I already extracted the number of support vectors, but the next thing that I want to do is I need to uh, predict. So uh, let me just call this sigmoid. Um, so I call it sigmoid, sigmoid SVM. Again, I can simply take this and then um, call it sigmoid uh, theified if. And then from there again, I can simply change this model, uh, SVM, sigmoid. So my book is not detecting it. <coughs> Maybe it's already there. Uh, <laughs> sigmoid. Yeah, so that's it. Then uh, the test data frame will stay the same. And then this one will be uh, sigmoid DOI. So that's wrong. Sigmoid. Then here again, SVM. Hmm, that's not what I want. My. Uh, yeah, this one. SVM sigmoid TFI. Actually, this is not how I, how I named it. How is that? <coughs> yeah, let me just bring it here. So SVM sigmoid, SVM sigmoid. That's my uh, my model. And then the best model will be simply passing this uh, best model after the regular. Yeah, let me just bring it. And the best model now I need to give it a, uh, the data frame, which is the test data frame. That is the TFID version of my test data frame. And then simply run it. Now uh, it's already there. If you want, you can uh, create a table and see, let's say, like this. So it's 162, 172, but we can also see uh, again for the other one. 161, 133. We don't know how this performs because we are we need to compare it with our test data frame. So for that, we can simply use our product, the function that we create. So this function calls uh, text the best model, and then the test data frame. So what it needs is these two two, um, two parameters. One is the best model, <coughs> the model that you trained, uh, and then uh, the test data. Actually, it's not the new data. You can use the test data. This is what it needs, and then um, yeah, we can run it. Then after that, you will see SPM. So I made an error here. Let me just uh, correct this one. SVM sigma base model. Now I will have a preset. There you go. So now again, uh, okay, 95% accuracy. This is amazing. 98% sensitivity and specificity of 91%. This is by far, by far the most, uh, the most accurate SVM algorithm that we have, that we have seen so far. Wow. So this is a uh, 92% positive predictive value. Still, you see the precision and uh, positive predictive value. They are actually the same thing. Um, so 92% is still very impressive. Um, our prevalence. I think the other ones is even the balance of accuracy. Actually, balance of accuracy is like <coughs> uh, uh, sensitivity plus specificity divided by, by two. It's arithmetic average of the two. But the other um, one, F1, is, is also, uh, because it's a weighted measure of sensitivity and specificity, it's again an impressive, an impressive score. Really, this algorithm uh, is working very, very well. Let me see the other one. Uh, let me see the other one. And then um, we change a few things. SVM, um, sigmoid. Yeah, this one here, and then I simply change this to TFID, the TFID version of my data. So there you go. <coughs> Again, uh, if I use a TFID version, um, it's not very different. Still, I have 95%. Oh, ah, yeah, okay, this is the second one. So this is again, uh, it's a good one, but it's not uh, it's not as, as good as the first one. So you see, um, I have, it has worked well in this case, uh, actually to identify uh, the COVID cases. Uh, majority of them are already identified, but in, in SARS, we have lost uh, a bit of papers. But generally, you see this algorithm is, uh, is again, is again impressive, but we will compile all of them. We will compile all of them in, in a table, uh, and then we see uh, you can easily 
you know we can uh, extract all these values uh, all of them and then we can have like a table a table structure so you can have you know linear svm and then the next one sensitivity specificity uh, maybe we can also calculate confidence intervals and see see it in in, in a really in a very elegant kind of table otherwise uh, this may be not easy because every time you have to scroll up and down uh, to compare to compare the values which algorithm is actually working uh, working well um, so that will be my next session but for now i can uh, add uh, one last thing uh, maybe i can add um, I can go in one of one of the models and then uh, plot them. Maybe uh, put them in a plot. Let me extract the values. Uh, once I extract the values, I can uh, we can plot them. To plot them, what we need is again we can uh, see the these values, the cost and the gamma values and the error, and then we we plot them in simply ggplot ggplot2 or something, and then we see uh, where actually our best model is. It's simply to put it in a graph and then see uh, where your model is. It's a little bit of code, but uh, that's uh, that's doable. But let me maybe try which of, which of, which one is my best model. Uh, actually, this is SPM sigmoid model. That's uh, my best model. So let's Let's go with that. Um, so now let me add few few cells, and then <coughs> maybe I can start uh, with this model, so with the two, and then we can plot them side by side. So maybe that's a little bit of code, uh, but, uh, but let's do it. So the cost would be the first thing you need to do is the cost. So let me have SPM performance. Um, that's uh, actually this SPM performance. The names are uh, you can check the names actually. Now it's a cost and gamma. So you, you see the cost, gamma, error, and dispersion. This is what we need. So we have all of the values. So let's say if you print. Um, SVM performance gamma, and you will be able to see all the gamma values. Let's say if I print the cost, and then I have all the cost values. So I have all of them. I can bring each of them, and then finally I can put them in a data frame, and finally I can you can calculate accuracy or something like accuracy is like uh, one minus zero. Uh, but you can also see the dispersion. Uh, then these are the dispersion values and the gamma. The gamma values are actually the values that we have already we ourselves supplied when we are tuning our algorithms. So these are, are the values that we ourselves supplied. And then um, the other thing is yeah, we have already seen all of them. Yeah. So that's how you extract these values. The, so let me extract the cost. The cost would be um, the cost. And then um, again, I can simply change things. Um, so gamma dispersion error. So let me call this one <coughs> gamma. And then this one let me call it gamma. So I can simply change things and still use uh, what I've already written. And then the next one is error. So let me call this error. And then uh, let me do this error. And then what? Dispersion. Dispersion. And then here, dispersion. Yeah. Now I have everything. Uh, then uh, let me uh, still, I can calculate accuracy. Accuracy acts actually uh, 1 minus error. 1 minus error. The error would be uh, error here. So or you can also use, uh, this is error, not error. So 1 minus error. And you can you can actually put this one here and then see it's the same result. And then let me run all of this. So I have already assigned them, but I can I can also check uh, like you know SVM best parameters. Or, I mean, what are the best parameters? For example, uh, actually I need to do this for both uh, and for both um, this for sigmoid and then for the TFID version of the data. So let me begin. Uh, actually, uh, once I graph that, I can uh, again uh, put the other one down here. But I can still change things. Let me let me just to another one so now um, okay let's wait with this one actually let me get this one and then uh, maybe the next one is to combine all of them and create a data frame so let me just use a c bind and then combine all of them so let me call it svm models svm models df data frame and then c bind and now cost i can call it the cost the gamma gamma ready there and the error uh, error error dispersion Dispersion and accuracy. accuracy. And then finally, I can simply call my as data frame because ggplo2 likes to have a data frame. So I can simply call this as data frame and then um, everything will be will be ready. Actually, I can put this down and it can be more, more readable. <coughs> uh, now, um, so let me again uh, calculate the mean actually, the mean because I, that's where my best model is. Let me, let me just, uh, <laughs> let's see how this looks like. Let's run it and then see uh, our data frame. Something wrong. So cost is um, yeah. My Jupyter notebook is, is too fast. Accuracy, accuracy again. Oh, I don't have any other error. Hopefully, error. error okay. <laughs> yeah. Now it should be yeah. It's already there. So now let me check how my data data frame looks like. Uh, maybe you can check the head. I can check the head and then run it. So this is how my data frame looks like. Uh, but you can check the dimension also. So I have 112 values and five different variables. So if I print it, I can also view it <coughs> like this. So I have this kind of data frame. So I can use and now because it's a data frame. I can use a simply uh, ggplot, ggplot2, and then plot the gamma and the cost, the error values in in um, uh, in, in, a, in a plot. So that's uh, what I need to. Do. So let me just call it plot SVM. 
uh, plot SVM, maybe PSVM, PSVM, and then uh, call my ggplot, ggplot function, uh, then let me <coughs> call the data frame, first object, or you can also do like piping, but I can simply use ggplot as my uh, title, my data frame, and then the first argument would be um, the x variable, let me just use the cost, and then uh, the y variable would be the error, and then let me just use color, uh, could be yeah, I can use color, maybe gamma. And then, um, yeah, so once I have that, I can simply do uh, join point. Join point, because I want to mark them. And then, um, maybe let me put this down so that it can be more readable. And then, again, another join uh, function. Let me use another one, which is join. Actually, this one also, I can put it here. And then, uh, maybe join line. Join line. So once I have that, um, you can. You can have a look. So SVM models, um, ggplot. Actually, this comma should be this graph should be outside. So let me plot it here. So that's uh, yeah. So now I can actually put this one here and print it and see how the graph looks like. Yeah. So the graph looks like this. So you know, if it, it started from very high error value and then it goes down uh, to low, but we have to find out where that uh, model actually is. So where is that the minimum error? So we need to find the minimum value. It looks, it's somewhere here, um, but we have to see where that's, and, and I can actually line, draw a horizontal line, like a horizontal line, you know, uh, where that error is, and it can tell uh, that's uh, where your, um, uh, your best model is. <coughs> so for that, maybe uh, we have to see um, our, um, the minimum value, the minimum, like the minimum error, so which corresponds to Let's say, let me just go back and then see the error. So let me see uh, where is the minimum. So let me just print min, minimum value of SVM error, and that's 0 0.06. So now uh, this is the value that I want. So then um, I can mark that point as JOM H line and then uh, also can add another another JOM segment or something uh, to, uh, to mark it. So maybe let me copy this. Actually, I can um, take a value a little bit. Uh, uh, bigger, a little bit bigger than, I mean, smaller than this. So let me, so actually, let's go back and then add um, join each line. Why is it going there? Okay. Anyway, join each line. Um, that's uh, what we need, join each line. And then uh, y-intercept. The y-intercept should be somewhere. That's the value we have, but we can kind of make it a little bit bigger. 0 0.67 maybe. Mm, then, and then let me color it. Color would be dark green. Let me put it that way, and then a line type, line type, line type, it's already taking it, line type, okay, should be, let me make it dashed. Now, I can also define the size, 0 0.7, the size of the line, and then a plus, what else do I need, a uh, geom line, uh, let me see what this looks like, okay, hopefully I don't have an error, yeah, okay, there you go, so this is where my um, so it's going a little bit high, higher. Uh, what if I actually do the same? <coughs> actually, I, can, I can simply, uh, where was that? Yeah, 0 0.66. Let me just see. Yeah, so this is where my uh, my model is. So you can also point, add a pointer. So to add a pointer, this is between uh, 0 and 5. So I can simply, um, yeah, create some kind of drone segment and then see mark it in red color. Maybe I can add, maybe I can put this down here and then um, add but the readability is a bit is a bit boring. So I wanted to put it here. Because join line, it's a join function, so it should not should not be anything. Okay, so now um, it should be possible to add another segment, but still it doesn't doesn't look good. Join segment, that's what I need. And then for the join segment, I need the aesthetic in the x. The x value should be uh, somewhere between five because I want to draw some pointer here. So because I want to draw some pointer. So this is zero and this is five. So this is probably somewhere mm, two point five or something. So let, I can use three. And then I can mark that point uh, going from 3 to, okay. <coughs> so for the segment, x could be, this is kind of trial and error actually, I mean you can uh, assign, um, let me maybe put it, the x value should be 4, and then the y value should be something smaller than this, otherwise, uh, um, yeah, I mean the error is on the y, so the y value should be uh, something, because I don't want to touch that, so let me just put it a little bit smaller, smaller than that one, and that could be somewhere 0 0.65 maybe. I can also do it the same way like this, um, but yeah, let, let me see how this looks like actually. Okay, something wrong, and then the x int. Ah no, we didn't define the x int and the y int. So, from segment three, x and y, and the x int 
and the y int. So that's what they want. So they want the x int and the y int. Let me make the x int um, like 0. Point. No, so x is 4. So where is should it end? So it started from 4, um, actually. So I, um, okay, let me again put this graph again. Hmm. Yeah, anyway, in the graph, uh, we need to plot it again. <clears throat> so for that, uh, if you remember, the x-axis is between 0 and 5. So it can start from 5 or 4, but the y, the x int, the x int should be... Um, okay, let me print this again and see where that's actually in. So instead of trying to remember what, what was printed, actually, jump point. Actually, I don't need to see, so if we put it in line, so this is uh, between those, it, it can start from 4 and then the x int can be um, somewhere 1. So let me put it as 1. The x int can be somewhere around 1. <coughs> and the y int can be smaller than this value because I want to define that. So 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.5, so 0 0.05, maybe 0 0.06, 0 0.06, and then see how this looks like. Oh my god, this is wrong. So something is wrong. Uh huh. 0 0.06, that's 0 0.7. Size 0 0.0 dashed x int x is 4. Ah, okay, this is wrong. 0 0.06, that's why it was uh, 0 0.066. Now let me see. Okay, now it's uh, the line. Maybe I can make it uh, red and then define an arrow. Let me just. Let me just <coughs> and, okay, let me just add something here. That's getting arrow. Okay, let me make it an arrow. So to make it an arrow, I can define this arrow function and then arrow. Then uh, links. Let me give it uh, links of a unit. I think this is what you need. It's more. Uh, I think it's, it's also written in um, digit bottom, so you can find it in centimeter. So and then um, after that, I can use uh, the color. Mm -hmm. Color. Let me make it red. For this, defining size is also good. Size 1.2. Yeah, so it started somewhere, no, but I want it to point to here. So this one is to be changed. <coughs> so there seems to be some error in my in my y value. So 0 0.066, maybe the y int should be around 0 0.05. Maybe then it may look something better. Yeah, so it's, I need to change this value. So instead of pointing somewhere here, this value needs to be somewhere from 5, 0. Maybe uh, this is a 5, I know the x int, but the y int uh, should be somewhere 0, the y start. Maybe let me just, the y can, be, can start from 0 actually. Let me just see. <coughs> This looks like this is this kind of trailing here. So I can simply shift it. So now it's we are fine, but I can simply shift it a little bit up and then um, we can point. So this is where actually our, our model is. So this is the error. Um, so you can you can kind of uh, plot them all and then, yeah, then uh, you can also plot them side by side. I can plot another one for, for example, for the other one. So to do that, I can simply um, pause this and then uh, redefine everything. Let me just again. My PC starts getting to be slow. So now, uh, for the other one, this VM, this VM sigmoid, uh, not this one. This is what I need. So now, let me replace all of them. Mm, one minus error. And then after that, I can save it with a different name. <coughs> Instead, now again, SVM models, uh, TF, TF IDF. Yeah, I mean, I don't worry about it because they are. Uh, Sequential, so once it is run, and the next one, and then uh, so we, we, we don't worry about uh, how different data frame will be replaced. The cost and the, yeah, those values will not, will not have any problem. So let me again port this and then call this one here. Uh, no, very good. Let me just uh, see the values, but I need to print uh, the other error. So the error, the mean, I need to see the mean, the mean value of that, the error value. So let me just print this and then the mean, the mean value of that. Now the mean is 0 0.09, so then uh, I need to change things. So let me just say the y intercept is 0 0.09. Um, actually, I can simply use that value. 0 0.098, I think it's fine, it's surrounding. <coughs> 0 0.09. And then um, size 0 0.7. Let me, x should start somewhere from 4, maybe, I don't know. And then um, 0 0.09, so the y int should be uh, somewhere around 0 0.08. And should start from. Yeah, let me, just, let me see how this looks like. And then see, and this one, let me save it as TFIDF. Put TFIDF. Now again. Yeah, so it's somehow, um, yeah, it's pointing a little bit, but you can also do, uh, you can also put them side by side, but this is uh, more more of like um, part work. So let me just call it library. Part work is like you can't, you can't 
put two things uh, side by side at work. I think it's at work. This is how I'm not actually sure. It's failing. Let me just at work. ggplot2. Yeah, this is patchwork. <coughs> so let me just use that. And the good thing with patchwork is you can simply um, add plots and then it's, a, it's really, um, yeah, I'll show you how it works. Plot SVM, I think it's P. So it's like P SVM okay, plus P. You can simply add two ggplot, two ggplot objects and then you can plot them side by side. So this is how it looks like. It's so a little bit um, compiled, like congested. Uh, but this is where uh, in the first module, so, so you know when you see it side by side, so that means the first module has a smaller error. So you see this is um, so it's 0 0.1, 0 .1, so it's, you see it's a smaller error. So this is where my um, um, error is for the first module, but for the second module, this is where the error is. It's approximately actually close to 0 0.0.1, it was 0 uh, 0.09. So that's uh, how you can extract this cost and gamma and all the values, and then you can uh, put some in a data frame. In my next session, I will. Uh, uh, I will extract. You know, I will show you how you can extract all uh, all my <coughs> all these values. You know, all these like uh, all these sensitivity and uh, and then put them in in the table in the data frame. So it's, you can access them anytime. And then you can instead of you know going uh, confusion all these confusion matrix for each model and comparing them might be uh, time taking. Instead, you can collect them all in in a table and then you can even save it in, in Excel or something. Yeah, that's what I want to do next. And also next, I would also uh, want to proceed further in uh, regularized regularized models. Uh, you know those like elastic net, ridge lasso, uh, those. Kind of models. They are really um, very fast. Uh, GLMNet. So if they are, they have a really nice package called GLMNet. So with GLMNet, we will, uh, we'll do, I will do some uh, little bit uh, theoretical intuition, and then I will show you how you can uh, run GLMNet. Um, yeah, GLMNet into you know, for text classification. Actually, uh, the regularized models they are suitable for for text data because they they are able to uh, um, handle. Um, kind of uh, text data, which has uh, many variables, many features like the text and genetics data. So you have in this kind of data, you have more number of uh, columns and number of rows. This is what I will do again in my uh, in my next tutorials. But once we complete this uh, text, uh, maybe after that I can do one, uh, maybe random forest or something, and then um, after that we can compile all these models and then uh, kappa flies kappa actually for multiple waiters. We can see how models. Uh, uh, correlated in the prediction, how the prediction agree with each other. Uh, we can we can do that kind of stuff, but I'm more interested in more uh, you know research synthesis. Uh, so I would like to proceed further on uh, on meta analysis and uh, doing more systematic reviews and things like that. And how to simplify this work in in using uh, using this uh, text mining, um, text classification, and the like. Yeah, these are the topics that I will be uh, working in the next tutorials. Until then, uh, enjoy enjoy machine learning or enjoy text classification. Thank you very much.